the microphone. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests. My name is Mara Lepaluoto, and I am a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of the campus. With respect for the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices, to learning new ways of being in community, in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and with the land itself. Today's service is led by Yuri Yamamoto, who was born and raised in post-war Japan. She was the, musical, the music director at the UU Fellowship in Raleigh, North Carolina, and she's starting a position as chaplain of the North Carolina Department of Corrections in two weeks. Oh, I forgot the book. Hold on. All right, she will be selling her book after the service, Unitarian Universalists of Color, Stories of Struggle, Courage, Love, and Faith, after the service. All right, today's music is led by director, music director Dr. Zaneda Robles and guest pianist Katie Eames. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary or the narthex. The family service is on hiatus for the summer and will return in the fall. After the service today, the Globe Forum will meet in the dining room or on Zoom at 11.15. Also, in the living room, there's a drop-in chalice circle. All are welcome, no registration required. The topic today is belonging. We are so excited to welcome Reverend Omega into our community. She has officially started. And she looks forward to meeting you all in the coming weeks. You're invited to join Reverend Omega for a getting to know you tea time. You can find the sign up in our newsletter. Next Sunday is our Music Sunday. It will explore concepts related to religious naturalism through music and poetry, including the US premiere performance of Robles's Bluenda Boima. <laughs> Listen does. <laughs> means blossoming trees, performed by the Zaneda Stewart Robles Summer Choir. It will be a morning of music you will not want to miss. An order of service, our order of service and many more announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email posted in the Narthex or through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service.
Today is another day. The sun has risen and will set. And tomorrow will be another day. Yet today is a special day. It is a miracle that all of us are here in this very moment, bringing all of our stories with us, whether we know them or not, bringing all of our feelings with us, even if we don't want to believe that. So on this special day, the special moment of being together. Let us be brave and be open to whatever is going to happen in the next hour or so. And am I supposed to write the chalice? I hope I am. with us today, um, someone who I've known for several years, and it's an honor for you to be with us in our sanctuary today. So please, will we please welcome, let's welcome you. <laughs> My friend, please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing our opening hymn, number 1051, We Are. Giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions 
to a local social justice organization or activity. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code or the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text instructions shown on the screen. If you wish to make a payment toward your pledge or contribute to church operations, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donation box. This week, our gifts go to LA Innocence Project. Please welcome our guest to tell us more about it. Uh, good morning. My name is Maurice Hastings, and uh, I just want to speak on behalf of uh, Los Angeles Innocence Project. I was, uh, I was a victim of uh, shady police work about 38 years, about 39 years ago, and I was uh, arrested and convicted of a crime that I didn't commit, and I spent 38 years in prison for something I didn't do, but with the help of the Los Angeles Innocence Project, I was able to get my freedom back, and now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy, I'm with my family, I'm moving along in life, and, and, and I, thank, I, thank, I thank the Los Angeles Innocence Project for, for giving me that opportunity, and I also encourage you to uh, support organizations like this, it helped me get my life back, and it contributes to humanity, and that's what we should be all about. I thank you for your time. Will the volunteers please come forward? Thank you for giving generously. Thank you so much. sing this song just like the way we used to sing in Japan and just the first verse and there are four verses so I am going to then read the translation of all of the four verses <laughs> Miori no home, umeshi yaketsuchini. Ima wa shiro i hana saku. Ayurusu magiken bakuo. Mitabi yurusu magiken bakuo. Our hometown was burnt down. We buried loved ones' bones in the burnt soil, where today white flowers bloom. Ah, we shall never allow atomic bomb. We shall never allow the third atomic bomb on our cities. Raging ocean in our hometown Black rain, there was no joyful days. Now there is no one on the boats. Ah, we shall never allow atomic bomb. We shall never allow the third atomic bomb on our cities. Heavy sky in our hometown. Black clouds still cover the land today. No sun can be seen. Ah, oh, we shall never allow atomic bomb. We shall never allow the third atomic bomb on our cities. Brothers and sisters worked hard to accumulate riches and blessings. All are gone now. Ah, we shall never allow atomic bomb. We shall never allow the third atomic bomb in the world.
Let us pray together. God of many names of understanding. On this day, the Hiroshima day, guide us how to understand such atrocities. What do we do with this knowledge to create so much distractions. How could we reconcile with the understanding of the of, of this understanding that we have now in our hands the power perhaps that only belongs to you. Guide us, help us make sense, and help us find hope in this difficult world where we carry so many bombs that could destroy all of us so many times. I love you and trust you. Whether you may be just a presence or the creator or the healer or whatever the name we give you, or perhaps there is no such thing as God, still, I love you and trust you because you are in, within each of us. Amen. you to echo what I sing. There's no wrong notes. Whatever your spirit tells you will be the right notes. Listen, listen to my story. sharing a story of my own choice. For this brief moment, I ask you to suspend your own voice and with no judgment, assumptions, or distractions. Let my story seep into your heart.
In July of 2005, I went to Hiroshima with two of my daughters. My second daughter was 17 and recently learned about the atomic bomb in school. She asked to include Hiroshima as part of our trip to my home country. Her baby sister was only eight months old. I have been there before I came to this country, but don't remember exactly when. I was a young adult and alone. Growing up in Japan in the 60s and 70s, on Hiroshima Day and the Nagasaki Day, I joined many Japanese people to remember the lives lost by the atomic bombs. I remember singing the song I just sang, shall never alone, may never allow atomic bombs. I often heard the words inscribed on the panel in front of the Hiroshima Peace Monument. It reads, rest in peace, shall never repeat the mistake. The title of the song and the inscription follow the convention of the Japanese language that often does not specify the subject. In these cases, we is implied, but it begs the question, who made the mistake? We might even ask, what mistake? Today's sermon title is My Hiroshima, My Hiroshima. I'll share with you what Hiroshima has meant to me and my parents. Through these stories, I'll attempt to answer those questions. I recently watched the movie Oppenheimer there are so many things we could talk about that movie, but I want to tell you just one thing that really struck me. When the Manhattan Project team tested the first atomic bomb, Trinity, they saw a gigantic fireball. Oppenheimer and his colleagues seemed to be excited and in awe of what they had accomplished. But I saw the images of people who look like me burning and screaming and tossed around in the fireball. As a child growing up in Japan, I have seen such images and heard and read about those stories over and over. It was surreal and absolutely horrifying. I also felt exposed in a the theater. Even though there were no other people sitting near me, I knew that there were many more people, mostly young and white, sitting behind me. I might have been the only Japanese person in the theater. Did they notice how I was feeling? Did they see and feel what I saw and felt? Do American people care that my people, children and adults, soldiers and civilians alike, instantaneously burned to death or died slowly, pinned under the fallen furniture or a collapsed house and engulfed by the fire. 
Did they even think about the agony of those who perished or those who could never find their loved ones in the ruin? Do they know that these people had names, lives, families, and dreams? Are they just part of abstract numbers, like hundreds and thousands of death, or worse, just a bunch of enemy Japs? When I was a child, my parents gave me a book entitled or When I Was Little. It is a collection of children's memoirs written several years after the war. Children remembered how they experienced the bomb. Some were playing with friends when they saw the bright light. Others saw a bomber in the sky before their house collapsed on them. There was a story of a girl who was running away from the fire. The story was unfinished where the girl and her family could not find the way out of the fire. For a long time, I wondered about her and her family. Did she die? Or did she survive? I can still remember my feelings. After I grew up, I realized that she must have survived to write that story. But that realization did not erase the fear that I felt for her. And her survival doesn't mean that she wasn't severely burnt or later died from radiation sickness. For me, as a young person, it was the Americans who made the mistake of using the atomic bombs to kill so many innocent children and their loving families. My parents gave me many more books about the atrocities of wars. I believe that this was their way of teaching me that we must fight against wars. As I grew up, I also understood that the Japanese have also made a lot of horrific mistakes that led to the devastating defeat. Hiroshima, for me, was then a symbol of human suffering and our commitment to peace and justice in the world. Even though my parents gave me books and other information about wars, they hardly talked about their own personal experiences of World War II and other wars that Japanese had waged against Asian neighbors. I remember asking my father about it. His response was that his experience was nothing compared to other people's suffering. And he said that he could never go to Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Okinawa because so many people had died there and that their death saved his life. Two of his high school classmates actually died in Nagasaki while attending a medical school to avoid military draft. My father said that they went to Nagasaki because they didn't want to die, but they were killed by the atomic bomb. My father was drafted into the Japanese Imperial Army in March of 1945. When he was discharged from the army, the train that took him back home was supposed to go through Hiroshima. But it had to detour because of a strong typhoon. 
What would he have seen had his train traveled through Hiroshima? A burned city, people living in shacks, smokes from mass cremation, or people with severe keloids. Over 60 years after Japan's defeat, my father began writing about his experience on his publisher's online newsletter. Originally, they were scheduled to be shipped to Okinawa. But before they reached Okinawa, the Allies had taken those islands. So, they were stationed on the southwestern part of Kyushu Island, close to Okinawa. Every day, he practiced crawling under an imaginary American tank with a fake bomb. The goal was to blow up himself with the tank. Can you imagine practicing a suicide over and over every day? On the VJ day, everyone was told to destroy all written stuff, whether official or personal. He threw his tiny journal into a bonfire. He could not remember, or perhaps did not want to remember, what he had written in the journal. His earlier journals left at home were lost in one of the Tokyo air raids, but I have his post-war journals starting on September 29th, 1945, when he reached his grandfather's home, uh, where, the home where his grandfather grew up. I could see that my father was deeply depressed and had trouble finding meanings of life. His identity as the eldest son of a deeply religious family of generations of Shinto priests was shattered when Shinto as the imperial state religion along with the empire were dismantled. He eventually graduated from Tokyo University and became a communist union organizer. He met my mother there, but had trouble finding and keeping jobs despite his elite education. He carried deep shame about his own complicity and his family's involvement in the imperial colonialism. When I was growing up, my father had a stenography business, but often devoted his time to community activism, activism such as the co-op movement, or advocating for women's leadership and PTA. After I went to college, my father decided to move away from Tokyo, where he was born and lived most of his life, and started a new business of publishing and stenography. In this capacity, helped many people publish their truth, including wartime stories. For my father, Hiroshima, along with Nagasaki and Okinawa, was a symbol of his survivor guilt and shame of imperial colonialism. These dark feelings drove his activism, but also heavy drinking, smoking, cheating on my mother, and complete silence. Like my father, my mother was an activist. My father once told me that during her pregnancy with me, she went to political demonstrations against the renewal of Japan-US security treaty. Does that make me an activist before I was born? <laughs> well, at any rate, as a child, I remember going to her study group against nuclear weapons. It was a small group of women and a male university professor 
who met in a small room with tatami mats on the floor. I remember watching them from the corner. They sat on the floor around the wooden low table and seriously discussed many things I didn't understand. I recently, I looked up the group's history online and learned that they were a group of housewives concerned about the radiation exposure of Japanese fishermen from an American hydrogen bomb testing in the Pacific. Their petition signature drive spread not only through Japan, but throughout the world. I didn't know that I was witnessing such a historic moment. I also remember a stack of booklets filled with black and white photos of the mushroom clouds, charred bodies, injured people, and destroyed cities. I don't have the book anymore, but those images are etched in my mind forever. My mother also took me to Hiroshima visuals at Maruki Gallery for Hiroshima panels. The artist couple, Mr. and Mrs. Maruki, witnessed the aftermath of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and painted a series of enormous pictures. If my father did not talk much about his experience, my mother talked even less about her life. She didn't leave detailed journals like my father did either. Her baby sister told me what she knew. Aside from their mother's early death that forced my mother to take care of the family as the eldest girl, I only know that at some point she moved to an occupied territory in China. On the VJ day, she was living and working as a telephone operator in the Japanese concession in Tianjin, China. I have two pictures of my mother and her friends taken in a photo studio in Tianjin two weeks before the defeat. They are dressed relatively well and show no signs of worry about how drastically their lives would change so soon. Writings on the back are hard to discern on these old photos, but it sounds like one of the friends was moving away. After my mother died, I found a brief note on her accounting book on the VJ day in the early 1980s. Quote, the day of defeat. It's getting as hot as that day. Images of Chinese flags fluttering in the blue, blue sky and nicely dressed Koreans marching are still vivid in my mind's eye. While saying, quote, never again to engage in the war, end quote, Japan has come this far. Can I believe it or not? End quote. My mother never used the word, the end of the war, like many other Japanese people. She always used the word defeat with a sentiment that we lost because we were wrong. Her silence meant her shame of being on the wrong side of the history. I believe that this brief note connects her sense of shame to her activism. Because of Japan's defeat, she and other Japanese people living in the former Japanese territories became refugees. Their dreams of better life in the imperial colonialism evaporated. Oops. 
and they had to find a way back to war-torn Japan and rebuild their lives from scratch. Hiroshima to my mother was a symbol of the atrocities of war, guilt, and shame of Japanese imperial colonialism, a deep distrust of the Japanese and American governments and religious institutions, and her determination to prevent the Japanese to get into any war, even if American government wanted it. I believe my father also shared many of those sentiments. They were critical of American wars in Asia and how Japan prospered and participated in them. My parents wanted new life and new Japan. They distanced themselves from their families of origin and religious traditions. They tried to run away from their past. They meant to protect me, their only child, and themselves from another war. But their silence was deafening, and the weight of their shame was heavy. I came to this country trying to run away from Japan and those shame and silence and geographically cut of myself and my children from our family, country, and culture of origin. I didn't talk much about my own life to my children either. I recently asked my second daughter about the trip we took to Hiroshima. She told me that she wanted to visit Hiroshima because it was an important part of our history. She, was, she, unexpected to, she didn't expect to see the real life dolls depicting the people after the blast. It was shocking, she said, and sent me the pictures that she took. She also said, that she experienced it as more like a Japanese than an American. Her feelings were complicated because we, the Japanese, were also the aggressors in the war. My baby daughter, who's 18 now, does not remember going to Hiroshima or, in, or Japan. I recently told her my paternal family's stories of participation in Japanese imperial history that I had been uncovering. My father's father's younger brother was a Shinto priest in the imperial shrine in colonized Korea. For the moment, she thought it was cool. Then I told her that this shrine was a big part of the imperial project to strip Korean people's language, name, culture, and religion to make them Japanese, except only the second class. She seemed shocked to hear it. I also told her that my father's mother's father's youngest, younger brother was the division commander of the Japanese Imperial Army that invaded China. Under his leadership, atrocities like the rape of Nanking were committed. These are some of the stories that my father could not talk about. It has not been easy for me to find out and talk about them either. It has been even harder to accept that my father must have respected and celebrated the successes of his uncle and his great uncle. 
It has been impossible to imagine that my loving, peace-advocating, and justice warrior father and mother to have participated and believed in the horrific imperial colonialism. But this is the work I must do to free myself and my children from the shame I inherited from my parents. When I am liberated from the shame, I can begin my activism for real, not as an atonement for what my family, country, and people had done or hadn't done. Only if I confront the past with courage, I will be able to see the present and the future more clearly. Not as an escape from the past, but what we can imagine and build together. I don't believe that human suffering would end, but this is how we can sustain our hope and grow together. Friends, Telling stories of unspeakable truth is an act of sacred resistance. It names what must be named, helps us remember what must be remembered, liberates us from the shame of past hidden memories, and moves us forward when the system would not want us to remember or share those stories. The book, The Unitarian Universalists of Color, was one of such projects. And I hope that many of you, if you haven't read it, will read those powerful stories in the book. So, what are your stories? I want to hear your stories. Let's get to work. Amen, Ashe, and blessed be. Our closing hymn is number 1001 in our teal hymnal or on the screens above. Will you please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing breaths? Remember when you see the, the whoosh, we want everybody to make that sound. Whoosh. Everybody can go ah. Whoosh. With pride and, and vigor.
Crossroads, where you and I meet. Crossroads, where you and I meet. Crossroads, where we choose our destiny. Crossroads, where we choose our destiny. Crossroads, where God's labyrinth unfolds. Crossroads, where God's labyrinth unfolds. Crossroads, where we stand in the mystery. Crossroads, where we stand in the mystery. Crossroads, where you and I meet. Crossroads, where you and I meet. Crossroads, where we choose our destiny. Crossroads, where we choose our destiny. Crossroads, where God's labyrinth unfolds. Crossroads, where God's labyrinth unfolds. Crossroads, where we stand in a mystery. Crossroads, where we stand in a mystery. Crossroads, we are at a crossroads. All of our unique path have come to this place this morning at this crossroads. And our path will take us to different places when we leave this place. Yet, what we have received this morning from each other will stay in our heart as peace of each other's God, or spirit, or heart. So, take those sacred things within you as we part.